It's that time of year where I'm revisiting some of my favorite films from the past year. And I took a chance and decided, why well, not to revisit this Best Picture nominee? So this is Maestro, A Second Look. This film is written, directed, and starring Bradley Cooper. Uh, it also has Carrie Mulligan, who is nominated for Best Actress this year. In the supporting roles, it gets a little bit more nebulous because this isn't really a supporting role type of film. But uh, Matt Bomer probably would get third billing. Um, and then beyond that, uh, I guess Maya Hawke and Sarah Silverman are also in this. <laughs> if you're looking for people to pinpoint. Um, but it's it's amazing how much screen time Bradley Cooper and Carrie Mulligan actually take up in this film. Um, so, uh, this film also has audio description. It's done by International Digital Center, uh, written by Liz Gutman and voiced by Jamie Lemchek. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, pretty good. I had a second time to also appreciate the audio description for this film, which I thought was, uh, and, as exceptional as possible in a world that does not take into account um, a lot of the visual styles that directors choose. So like, for example, in this film, he uses a lot of aspect ratio changes to help you move through time periods. Um, and uh, cause we've never, we, we've used alter alternate <laughs> aspect ratios throughout time which is uh, for sighted people, sometimes films look stretched or they have black bars or whatever it is. It just depends on how the film is being presented um, largely because of however it was originally shot or created for. Even nowadays, if you watch a show that was created for television uh, back in a certain time period, you're going to have your black bars on either side of your screen because now we have widescreen TVs, but your show was created for uh the the old school square TVs. Uh, I don't know if anybody actually remembers when DVDs used to you used to be able to get um, like two different versions of it. You could get the the widescreen version or the uh, the I, I want to say flat is that what it was called. Um, yeah, you could get the other version of it on DVD in the early DVD days as if, like, that was how you wanted to permanently own something was, you know, make it formatted for a dying technology. Um, but then again, uh, if you had widescreen, what it did for your TV back in the day, if you didn't have a widescreen TV, was it shrunk it down so you had the black bars <laughs> on the top and the bottom. But you were prepared for the future because now if you have those widescreen DVDs, your shit looks awesome on TV. Anyway, um, all this coming from Blind Film Critic. Anyway, <laughs> so Maestro, uh, yeah, we don't we don't necessarily get uh, things like aspect ratio changes. I could go into this for, as a projectionist. We used to have to change between scope and flat. That's why I'm using the term flat is because I can't think of another term for it. Um, our our lenses, uh, films came in scope or flat, and uh, you rotated the. You had to know what print uh your lens need the need was anyway uh yeah so <laughs> that's where i got flat from i can't remember i didn't buy any of the of the of of those um made for square tv dvds so yeah he's playing with aspect ratio and we don't necessarily get that uh also anytime playing with colors, uh, stuff like that. Uh, some of the choreographed pieces feel a little underdescribed, but, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's also, uh, there, there are parts in this where I appreciate, um, the specificity in the audio description, like, um, when we are in the Macy's, uh, the Thanksgiving Day Parade, and they've got the parade floating around behind them, and they're having the conversation. It's hard to break up that conversation, 
But I do like the fact that at least when Snoopy comes around, they let us know that it's Snoopy outside. Um, the, the Snoopy balloon float thing that comes on the Macy's Day Parade. Uh, because he had just made such a big point about Snoopy in the, he's like, where's Snoopy? This is his day. Who, who forgot Snoopy? You know, um, he just made that big point. So it's nice to have at least that tie in. It's a very sort of nuanced thing. Uh, it's something that like as a sighted person, uh, obviously they don't stop in that conversation to say, Oh, look, Snoopy. <laughs> so, but it's something that a sighted person would have gotten and been like, Oh, cute. Uh, you know, there he is. Um, and we get that moment too. So many times uh, I've seen films where the studio seems to shy away from using uh, trademarked property that they've obviously paid the rights to use, but uh, shied away from using that in the audio description. A uh, great, uh, great example of this is Chippendale's Rescue Rangers. And another one would be Scream 6. Um with the, the scene with all of the the masks, the horror masks on the train, uh, where they just dodge all of the, the famous masks that are on that train um, for all of, like, you know, killers like Jason and, and uh, Michael Myers and stuff like that are on the, people wearing those masks, obviously paying a tribute because it's a horror film and Scream is very, is, is nothing if not incredibly meta. <laughs> It's always been, it was meta before meta was a thing. Um, uh, you know, I mean, the janitor was wearing Freddy Krueger's uh, sweater in the original, uh, directed by Wes Craven. So, I mean, there's there's so many little things uh, throughout, yeah, uh, throughout the Scream franchise that have always been a nod to something else. So that was, of course, a nod. Um and uh, which wasn't in the audio description. Sighted people got to talk about how cool that was. We did not. Uh, we heard from our friends, basically. <laughs> so here, I'm glad that they decided to say Snoopy. It's the only float they actually mention. Um, so I don't really know what else is behind them. I mean, I, I could find out. I could go out online and find people who are talking about all the different floats. Because believe me, if it's if it's happened, someone's talking about it on the internet. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah, uh, I could find that information, but I'm impressed at least with the Snoopy tie-in due to the fact that that uh, Leonard references it in an early scene. That's, that scene is also excellent. It's probably Carrie Mulligan's um, strongest scene in terms of uh, putting fire in in her character. Uh, you know, and uh, when she says that you know Leonard will die. Uh, <laughs> die a lonely old queen um just kind of like a kind of cuts like a knife you know because it it lets the audience know obviously that she knows what's he what he's what he's up to what he's doing and uh she's just not ha you know in that moment she's not having it of course later on um the film changes and and uh really this is about a complex relationship that um two people who shared over the course of their, you know, their marriage and it, not all of it is perfect. And that is what Cooper's here to show. Um, it doesn't feel like it's the, the, the stereotypical Leonard Bernstein biopic that we would have gotten because it wants to spend so much time with, uh, Carrie Mulligan and with, you know, uh, that side of Leonard, the the homebody side, uh, scenes with him and his kids, scenes with his wife, scenes with him at home, um, when very likely he was out doing all these other things. And as a matter of fact, we hear about how he's traveled the world and played for all these symphonies and orchestras, and, and um, he's composed for all these other things, but we don't really see that. We don't really see him working on compositions for, um, all of these sh musicals and movies, uh, and working with all of the talent that he's likely worked with at at, up to this point, because at the end of the day, he always comes home and it's very much about his relationship with his wife. And it's one of the reasons I appreciate Maestro so much is because 
it's not the obvious biopic. It's not the obvious way to go here. Um, even Walk the Line, the Johnny Cash, June Carter uh, biopic, really focuses more on their performing life. Um, yeah, there are some complications behind closed doors, but there's a reason why there's that Dewey Cox <laughs> um, <laughs> movie it, and it, why it, it walks so closely to Walk the Line is because Walk the Line feels a little bit more like a stereotypical biopic, um, especially coming out of that time period when you look at films like Ray. Uh, it feels like there's like a formula that's being followed. Maestro feels like it's trying to stray away from that formula and make up its own thing. And that's what I really appreciate. And Cooper, um, always thus far in his short uh, director career, uh, always presents women as they are, as strong, as uh, leads, as powerful. And even though he is... Uh, the experienced one in both of his films, in both A Star is Born and in uh, Maestro, he finds time in both of those films to let those women uh, shine, even overtake him. Uh, obviously more so in A Star is Born, but even here in Maestro, um, there are times where Carrie Mulligan is obviously doing the heavy lifting, especially towards the end of her character's um, plot. <laughs> her character's storyline. Um, so I still think this is a strong film. Um, I don't know that it's in my top 10, but uh, I'm glad I rewatched it. I think it has strong audio description. This is a this is one of those films where I respect it and it um it just falls a little bit short for me uh in a couple of areas one of them being the fact that Bradley couldn't find supporting cast members at all uh I think what he does here is good but it feels very weird because I feel like I never really get to know Matt Bomer you know, I feel like he's there only momentarily for fleeting seconds. And it's problematic of sort of the same thing uh, that he did with Star is Born, where he had sort of two leads and everybody else was just kind of like, well, way less important. Except for in that film, he really did get a beautiful performance from Sam Elliott. And um, even... Uh, Andrew Dice Clay uh, had some really nice moments. Here, it's really tough to pull these supporting cast members out and say, what did they do? What did you do? <laughs> uh, where is your moment? You know, where? Um, and I think Matt Bomer, especially because of the way that his character is, had an opportunity to just be given some slight... Um, time <laughs> to do, to to have a little bit more between him and uh, Leonard at the beginning, uh, just to establish maybe how their dynamic worked, um, how their relationship worked before he met Felicia, and uh I, that's that's probably the one that's now that I'm watching it for a second time that's probably the thing that misses for me is that while this film is about Leonard and Felicia he is in a relationship at the time but it doesn't really even feel like that it feels like it's it feels like so much like Matt Bomer's an afterthought in this whole thing like he's just uh, I'm here bye <laughs> like Cooper just wanted a recognizable face to break up with. And it would have been a lot nicer to see whatever his dynamic was to start with. Like, how was he in a relationship before? What was he like with Bomer? What was their dynamic like before he transitions into Felicia? And it's just, that's not in ingrained enough into this film. So that's just like one of my little p nitpicky things. Because um, it finishes the film with him... You know, I mean, he's 
driving up in a convertible with a much younger man, and it says in the audio description. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, obviously he's, this film does not shy away from uh, any of that uh, about his sexuality. So I don't know why Cooper uh, would avoid that. I don't know why Cooper is uh, staying away from Anyway, um, it, it's very odd. I would have just, if you're going to lean into it, lean into it. Don't, don't, dan don't dance around it. Don't just be like, mm, I'm going to show you a little bit. <laughs> so, okay, well, this actually would have been important to show uh, at the beginning and, and establish your character and establish what your character is like in a relationship, uh, establish what your character is like in a gay relationship, um, especially a gay relationship in the 40s. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, all, that, all that kind of stuff would have been nice, but uh, we didn't get that, so... Anyway, um, check out Maestro if you haven't checked it out. Uh, I know the uh, there's so much about his nose that is just uh, we we you know I, I I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I, we had the same conversation with Nicole Kidman and her nose and the hours. Um, yet some people still manage to go watch the film. I know it was amazing. Just the, the different times uh, we we were able to get past a prosthetic and uh, go check out a film. So, um, it's just, uh, just, yeah, yeah, you know what? People wear prosthetics sometimes in film. It's, it's a thing that happens. Um, end scene. <laughs> I, and we're moving on. The family endorsed it. The family wanted it. They agreed with it. They, that's how they wanted their, their, uh, father to be represented. This film has the full endorsement of the family, which I think is really important when you guys are trying to be upset on behalf of somebody. Um, so think about that. Anyway, check out Maestro. It's, uh, it's a lot better than, than you think. Um, uh, debatable about whether or not I would put it in the Best Picture Top 10. Uh, it does kind of feel like it's the 10th nomination, I'm not sure it is actually Netflix's best entry this year. I might have preferred that slot to go to May-December. Um, but it is a very strong film from Bradley Cooper. Uh, and I'm increasingly more and more interested with him as a director. And I would I can't wait to see what he does next. Uh, I feel like he could be one of the great actor-directors uh, that we've ever had. And um, he seems to really have an understanding of of the films that he's chosen thus far. So I'm excited moving forward. Uh, we may have like another Ben Affleck, Clint Eastwood, um, uh, Kevin Costner, I guess. <laughs> I, I can't, his, his whole career is not, but some of it is. <laughs> um, Mel Gibson's got some stuff in there that's interesting, that's good. So uh, I'm trying to think of other actor directors right now that are really strong and I'm, I'm struggling here. Greta Gerwig. There we go. Greta Gerwig. Why not an actress? So, um, yeah. So, go with, uh, check it out. Anyway, I'm gonna give Maestro once again an A-. minus. <sighs> Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing and following my thoughts down the rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> and I will see if this film wins anything at the Oscars. Uh, until then, I will uh, see you guys on the other side.